Okay, so now we've learned that labor, um, not labor, just any input, inputs are used to make outputs. And the way that we represent that in a shorthand math form is with a production function, okay? In the real world, lots of different steps and organizations go on there, and we presume that those details are known. But for the, our purposes, it's enough to just say, you tell us how many inputs you have of each type, we can tell you how much output you're going to get if you use them efficiently and follow our instructions, okay? Now, the inputs in any given society are not unlimited, right? There's a certain amount of people that can supply labor. There's a certain amount of capital and machinery that, out, that exists. We can increase that by building more, but we have to build it out of eventually raw materials and things, and those are also finite, at least the amount that we can uh, get, like in our, uh, that we can get our hands on is not unlimited. That means we can't produce as much of the output as we want. We can't produce arbitrarily large amounts of either output. There's scarcity in our world and there are trade-offs and we have to decide how we're gonna allocate our resources to produce goods. And there are trade-offs. If we allocate all of our workers to producing goods and we wanna produce more of one good, we have to pull workers away from the other one or pull machinery away from another production of another good, and that's gonna reduce production of that other good. So let's make this concrete. Let's focus on our hypothetical example of these colonists who've come from another world and they're setting up shop on a new planet. They've been traveling in some spaceship for a hundred years and they've been living in cramped quarters. They've been eating nothing but that Soylent stuff and it's they just want to change. All they care about, this is priority number one on their new world, is more space to live in and a little bit more variety in their diet. So all they care about is food and shelter. Those are priority number one as they figure out, as they move on to this new planet and figure out how to organize their society. We need to get some shelter and food. We're sick of being on the ship. Now, they've got a supercomputer and it tells them here's the most efficient way to produce food or shelter on this world using the resources you have. These guys can produce shelter, which I'm denoting with this letter S over here, with a production function that's got perfect substitutes. You take twice times the capital that's used to produce shelter, which I'm using a little k a capital K with a little S next to it for capital used to make shelter, and you add to that the labor, okay? And on the other hand, the uh, capital that you use to produce food multiplied by the labor that you use to make food, take the square root, multiply by two, that's how much food you get out of those guys, okay? So they have a Cobb-Douglas production function, production technology for making food, and a perfect substitutes one for making shelter. Now. These guys want to make as much food and shelter as they can, but they're limited in their resources, okay? There's the total amount of labor is equal to 100 colonists, and the total amount of capital is equal to 50 machines, okay? So if they want to make more shelter, you know, and they're using all their resources, there's going to be, uh, they're going to have to pull somebody away from making food production, okay? and that's going to reduce result in a loss of, of food okay so normally we would think that this economy is facing trade-offs okay you want more of shelter you're going to have to have a little bit less food you want more food you're going to have to have a little bit less shelter but that assumption that they face these trade-offs actually is not necessarily true it's only true if they're operating at an efficient frontier which is the first thing I wrote up here. When you're at operating, when your economy is operating efficiently, you're re using your resources well, and yes, you face these trade-offs that we would expect. But it's also possible to be operating your economy inefficiently, in which case it's possible that you might not face trade-offs. There might be ways to increase the supply, say, of food without sacrificing any shelter. So let me give you an example of two examples of how that could happen. So the first simple example, let's suppose that the amount of labor that's being used to produce shelter is 100, so all of the labor, and the amount of labor that's used to produce food is zero, there's none left over. And on the other hand, the amount of food that's used to produce, not food, the amount of capital that's used to produce shelter, we'll say is also zero, and the amount of capital that's used to produce food 
is 50, so all of the capital, okay? It turns out that this is inefficient. Even though they're using all the resources of their economy, they're not leaving anything to waste. It's, uh, it's being used in an inefficient way that is leaving a lot of sort of, uh, there's leaving a lot of free lunches out there as we say in economics. So let's see why that's the case. If they're producing in this way, we can see that the amount of shelter these guys make, here, I gotta scroll up a little bit. Given these production functions over there, uh, the amount of shelter that these guys are going to make is 2 times 0 plus 100, or 100. And the amount of food that they make is actually 0, because they have uh, L is 0 multiplied by anything else. Even 50 capital is also 0. So this is what they're making. Can they make more food without giving up some shelter? It turns out, yeah, it's, it's not hard at all. How do they do that? Well, we need to give a little bit of labor to food. So let's say move one worker from S. I need to scroll up a little bit more. From producing uh, shelter to food. Okay? If that was the only thing we did, then the amount of Shelter we would produce would drop down to 99, and the amount of food we produce would go to two times the square root of 50, because we now are multiplying this by one, since we have one worker there. That's greater than zero. Great. But you can see that here there was still this trade-off. We gave up a one unit of shelter. But there would be a be there's a better way to do this. If we move one worker from S to F, we can replace that worker with just half a unit of capital. Let's say we move one unit of capital from F to S, okay? In that case, because uh, shelter is equal to two times K, we've got now instead of zero people working on making, zero machines working on making shelter, we have one, so that's gonna be two. And then we have 99 workers, so we make 101 units of shelter. And how much food are we making? Well, two times the square root of 49, because that's how much capital we have making food, times the square root of one. I don't know what that is off the top of my head, but it's certainly greater than zero. So we can see here that in the initial equilibrium, where they were sort of lopsidedly allocating everything to producing one good and everything else to the other good, there was a lot of room for improvement. Here they've reallocated workers and capital in such a way that they've increased the amount of shelter and the amount of food. There was no trade-off, okay? They didn't have to give anything up. And that's because this original allocation was inefficient, okay? And this new allocation is also going to turn out to be inefficient, okay? As long as moving one unit of capital over to shelter and moving, you know, as long as you move enough capital over to producing shelter to replace laborers that move the other way, uh, and as long as basically the increase in... Uh, Let me rephrase that. Every time we move over one laborer from producing shelter to food, if we replace him with half a unit of capital, we don't sacrifice any shelter. But on the other side, we're gaining one laborer and losing half a unit of capital. As long as that trade-off is positive for the production of food, as long as getting one laborer and losing one capital increases food production, we're again in a situation where we're not facing trade-offs. And so what we're going to talk about in this section is the more exact criteria for when an economy is operating efficiently in terms of producing goods.